so to go quickly through assessment of critically ill patients, I have uh, no uh, conflict of interest to declare. Uh, so I will go through quickly. So is it objectives or general advice for junior colleagues? Uh, it will be like in a term of short, quick messages, depends on the level of your training, but my advice will be always be systematic between reading the lectures, um, practicing, and then uh, teach that to others. Uh, the ideal approach is always simplicity and structured approach. Try to always focus on being simple but structured. If you are a junior doctor and you have watched Dr. House, please don't be Dr. House. Don't focus on the rare pathologies. Start from the basics. And if you are a senior, again, please don't be another Dr. House and look for the rare. Common is common. And once you exclude all common scenarios, then this is the point you can start to look for the rare diseases, maybe in 10, 15 days, after the patient admission. But don't jump to the rare pathology and think, oh, it could be this or that. We find a lot of these scenarios with junior colleagues. Uh, when, where, and what makes a lot of difference? So where is your assessment running? Are you assessing this patient in the emergency department or in the ward, or you're assessing him in critical care unit, or uh, he is just landed from the ambulance? So where makes a difference? When? Is it after midnight or early in the morning hours? This is another difference. What are you assessing? What is the pathology? This is another difference in different patients. So how to look into the details? We always say devil is in details. So we want to be simple, but don't overlook anything. Okay? So. It looks easy, but it is really difficult. How to master it? There's only one way. Fake it till you make it. This lecture makes no sense, makes no addition to yourself if it just stays as a PowerPoint presentation. You need to write down, put a plan for yourself, and see if this plan can apply to yourself, and at the end, do this plan on daily basis, like repeat your assessment in the same manner every day. This is how you master this way of assessment. So fake it till you make it. At the end of this lecture, I will give good few examples of how I run through different pathologies in the assessment. And I will show you that the assessment could differ according to the patient presentation and the pathology. You are never alone, either junior, mid senior, senior, head of department, you are never alone. Experience counts, but when experience has a conflict with the guidelines, this is the time you need to think, I am not alone. That was one question in one of my interviews, job interviews, and he asked me this question. What do you think if you have experience in certain manner that contradict with the obvious guidelines. Will you go with the guidelines or with, will you go with your experience? Answering this question is a bit tricky. You are not alone. ICU and anesthetics are never a one-man show. Pick the phone, make an MDT meeting with one or two colleagues and discuss the case with him. If you had an agreement on one plan of care, even if it is against the guidelines, you are currently supported medically legally and medically against the guidelines. You are not alone. If it is just one man show, you could be biased with your subjective judgment. But if it makes sense and you hand it over that to a colleague and you have an agreement and this is the right management, now you can face the guidelines because you have multiple opinions. So you are never alone. Okay, handover from who and to who makes a lot of sense. So you need always to stress on five or six points. The major history of the patient. Is he with history of chronic heart disease, ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, COPD, obstructive sleep apnea. So the major points of the history, this is what you always need to start with. 
if you start with examination, you are building a big building on no foundation. So you need always to focus on the major history, the major systematic problems. Cause of hospital admission, why this patient came to the hospital? He could have came to the hospital with a pneumonia, with an ARDS or with a heart failure, always seek the cause of hospital admission. This is the second, second step in your step ladder fashion of assessment. Then the patient deteriorated and is requiring ICU admission. You are receiving a phone call from a colleague and he's saying, look, this is a hypertension patient and I have hypokalemia or hyperkalemia. So there is something missing in between. This is just for instance. You need to get the story in a stepwise fashion. How old is your patient? What are the comorbidities, the major comorbidities? Why he was admitted to the hospital five or six days ago or five, six hours ago? And then how was the hospital course? If he's deteriorating, what were the complications during the hospital course? And he reached to the ICU because of what? Then the current active problems. And usually the ICU patients are complex enough to have multiple problems in ICU. So you'll find your patient is shocked and ARDS, and he has gut failure, and in the same time has electrolyte disturbances. So you have to put your problems all together in just under one tent or under one title, current active problems. And then you think, I wanna examine this patient, focus the examination depending on these previous four points. The history is like his ischemic heart disease, and he has congestive heart failure, you need to carefully listen or ascultate the heart and chest. If he has a previous stroke, you need to go and assess during your examination the motor deficit and the quality of the pupils. It will make a lot of sense later on. And depending on your history examination and the investigations you ask it, if you ask it in AD about some investigation, to put a plan, and this plan should also build on the previous plans of management. So maybe you are diuresing your patient as a decision, but he was diuresed and he was bone dry and they are starting to rehydrate him now. So don't chase your tail or reinvent the wheel. You may need to in some occasions, but take that decision cautiously. So see the previous plan. So again, look at the patient in the current time and in the current situation in a context of what he had previously in the last few hours or few days. Now, how I should get prepared if I'm a junior staff, mid-senior staff, or senior staff? We are talking to everybody in this course, so it's a kind of refresher course for everyone. If you are a junior staff, you need to get practice reading chest x-ray. You need to know how to read the blood gases, and there will be sessions for each of these here in the course. You need to read the CT brain and you need to read the FAST. FAST is, fo is, is focused assessment with sonography and trauma patients. This is the minimum required skill from your side as a junior anesthetist intensivist, nothing below that. If you are a mid senior, I would recommend you extend your skills to eFAST. So have a look on the DVT and the PEs you have to master or try to start learning and master the echo skills. You need to master CT, brain, chest, heart, abdomen, and pelvis, and MRI. You need to get a touch of training on that. Pulmonary function tests, and in the arterial blood gases, you need to dig more in the stronger end difference and know what are the differences between regular blood gas readings and stronger ion difference technique. And once you become a senior, you have to master how to put all the puzzle together. Teach to keep your knowledge and skills. So what you teach now will push you to read more about it and refresh your knowledge. This is what we are doing here in the course. So everyone is mastering one or two or three topics and he is repeating that in teachings. He becomes a master of this topic, but he needs to listen and watch the others teaching as well to refresh his knowledge. I would advise you to have three important applications on your cell phone. The MedCalc, which calculates a lot. I, I said I have no conflict of interest, so I'm not uh, like advertising for these apps, but I feel it is really important. The up-to-date, you need to read the pathologies and advanced research in up-to-date. 
and the tox base if you're dealing with emergency department or acutely ill patients coming to your hospital tox base is one of the most beneficial apps in your cell phone so it will tell you if this is a toxicology screening for this patient and this is the result you need to give this and that in a protocolized evidence-based way so i would advise you to have a look on these applications or anything similar to those applications okay so now we need to go through the ABCD survey. This is my primary survey for every patient. A, the trick is always talk to your patient. If the patient is talking, so he is conscious enough, he can verbalize, so he can push enough tidal volume via his vocal cords in a phonation process, so he can express his words, and you can judge his mentality. Is he confused? Is he delirious? So this shows you that his airway is less jeopardized than somebody's not talking. Then once the patient is talking to you, have a quick look in his melampathy score, range of movement, thyromental distance, the quick airway assessment, because you may need to intubate him in a minute or two. So make use of time if your patient is talking, make use of quick airway assessment, because you may need that in a minute or two. Breathing. First thing you need to have a look is respiratory movement. Look at the chest rise. If there's any intercostal coastal retractions, count his respiratory rate. Put the pulse oximeter and have a look. Is he saturating well on room air or is this is a normal breathing mask? So what is the FI2? Please, when you listen to his chest, I always emphasize you have to listen in front and back. The front could be totally normal and this patient has bilateral lower lobe pneumonia affecting his lungs and only obvious in the back. So divide the lung into upper, middle, and lower zone, lower zones, and right and left, front and back. Train your ears because there is many occasions you need to trust your auscultation more than anything else. And I have lot, I've seen that a lot of times. Trust your auscultation more than the blood gases and the asthma patient, I'll give you a good scenario for that. So you have to train your eyes and ears because this is important. Your auscultation really matters. Circulation, go clinical first. Don't jump to the ultrasound machine before again you auscultate for murmurs, you auscultate for rails over the base of the heart or the base of the lungs, and then use your ultrasound. This is your modern stethoscope. Disability, look at the pupillary dilatation. If the pupils are unequal, don't jump to the diagnosis and ask for any previous eye surgeries. This is really important. If he had cataract surgery or if he has a LASIK or any previous surgery in his pupils, this really matters. Look if this patient is on a neck collar. If he is not and he is coming in an accident, please put the neck collar immediately. Modified log rolling in all accidents or injuries is mandatory until CT and sometimes MRI as well are mandatory. Test the sensory and motor for four limbs. This, if you need to and your patient is stable enough. Look in the lateralizing manifestation if the patient is paralyzed, paresis, uh, right more than left, one limb more than the other. And please check always in the very first insta instance, random blood sugar. Sometimes the patient who is unequal pupils, and I have seen it more than once, with fanning of his toes is just hypoglycemia. And in this instance, time is brain. So once you have a patient who is comatose or impaired conscious level, once you start your ABC assessment, ask, please, can we check for the blood sugar if it's not yet checked? You will find a lot of surprises patient who is coming with hypoglycemia and time is brain, so you need to manage that as quick as you can. Exposure, you have to examine the front and back of your patient, but be aware of once you expose the patient, the hypothermia clock started. So do that quickly in a modified log rolling in case of trauma, and then cover your patient and rewarm him with either a bear hugger or active warming depends, depending on his temperature. Secondary survey is uh, systematic again, and we'll go through that in the next slide. 
tertiary survey, once you had asked the history, the examination, and the investigations in details, and then you do the tertiary survey, maybe after two, three, four hours, look if you missed anything in the first, in the primary or secondary survey. It's not always feasible to put a patient diagnosis in the first few hours. So again, you need to work on this tertiary survey and repeat it and look, discuss it with different colleagues, senior or juniors. You try to avoid the tunnel division, to try to avoid the bias, and then you can get the tertiary survey completed. So after the ABCD survey, the systematic review and tertiary survey are all together. This is the ATLS or trauma life support survey technique. But when is my patient acutely ill just arrived to emergency department or within the first 24 hours admission? Or he's a chronic patient for a few days in the ICU. Should I go ABCD survey every time? No, this is the time matters. So when you are receiving the patient after 10 or 15 days, you don't need to go to the ABCD approach. You need to go to the problem-based assessment approach. So this patient had a history of trauma or versus heart failure, whatever the pathology, then you need to examine neurologically, respiratory, cardiovascular, renal, GRT, hematology, micro or ID or sepsis, whatever you call it in your hospital, then lines, okay? And then you look in the investigations, which are at least for every intensive care patient, FBC, full blood count, or CBC, whatever you call it. So you need to have a look on three important elements of that, the hemoglobin, the white cell count, the platelets, then the biochemical markers, which are UNEs or uh, urea, creatinine, and electrolytes, liver functions, and always, always, always do the trend of CRP if you are monitoring for infection. Coagulation profile is not always routine, but if, you are, if your patient is on anticoagulation infusions, you need, you need to do that at least once a day or twice a day, depending on your protocol. Then other investigations, again, tailored according to your patient. Fast hug is a part of the critical care assessment. You can audit that from either doctor's side, you can assign one intern to that, or nurse's side, and this is one of the ICU successes that is monitored as per QIPs or quality uh, improvement uh, uh, protocols or projects or uh, key performance indicators, depending on what you call it. What is the fast hug? It's seven letters, each is assigned for one system. Feeding, analgesia, sedation, thromboembolic prophylaxis, head of bed elevation to decrease the instance of hospital acquired or ventilator acquired pneumonia. U for ulcer uh, control, which is uh, any of uh, PPI, uh, either uh, H2 blockers or uh, the Prazole category or uh, glucose, G is glucose control, and your target glucose control is between 8 to 10 as per NICE guidelines. So fast heart feeding, analgesia, sedation, uh, thromboprophylaxis, head of bed elevation, ulcer prophylaxis, and glucose control, you need to check that again before you finish your patient and don't leave the patient on bedside before you review all his medications what was his medications at home what he is missing out of these medications so sometimes the patient is hypothyroid and he is not on any atroxin for a few days and he's not waking up and then we start to wonder and then we send e3 and e4 and then we discover that he is lacking his home medications so you shouldn't you shouldn't miss that. So review all the medications of the patient, what needs to continue, what needs to be stopped in, in, in the context of his current condition. And as we will go through this one uh, further, we'll find a lot of more details about the medications. Let's go now in more details. So please warn me about the time if I am behind the time. So neurologically or CNS, again, talk to the patient. Uh, is he in the emergency department? So always seek for toxicology screening and check the blood sugar, as I said. If he's in ICU, check what are the infusions running. Is he on midazolam, morphine, propofol? Is he getting anything as an IV PRN over the time that could be missed? Uh, if he's re receiving anything, nasogastric tube, uh, sedation uh, drugs, uh, consider it in the context of your renal and liver profile. So if he's on midazolam, for a few days and he has renal impairment, you're expecting him to uh, recover neurologically after longer time. 
if his GCS is low, is it metabolic disorder or structural problem? So look for the lateralizing manifestation. Unequal pupils, weakness in one side may guide you uh, towards structural problem. If not, nothing lateralizing, I will consider the metabolic as well. So use uh, unequal pupils, uh, seek history of the eye surgery. I mentioned that before and previous exams. You may find that point was there from previous exams. Uh, paresis versus paralysis. Uh, consider if your patient was deaf or mute. So sometimes you do jump to the, do the painful maneuver and the patient is jumping out of bed because he didn't hear you because he was on hearing aids and the nurse on admission removed it and nobody declared that for you. Is he depressed and just don't want to talk? So consider everything. Seizures, please seek the medical uh, manifestation or the clinical manifestations of seizures, dilated pupils, rolled up eyes, tachycardia, which switches on and off quickly. Uh, so patients suddenly become tachycardic and suddenly goes back to his normal rhythm uh, with dilated, uh, dilated pupils and eyes rolled up. All that will give you some clues about some uh, non-convulsive seizures or silent seizures. Always examine the neck and always do the CT brain before your lumbar puncture. Don't do that mistake. I have seen it a few times in my life. The last one was a brain tumor and he was in, the tumor was in brain stem and it cost him a lot. So he herniated after uh, the LP and that was discovered in the CT later on. Compared to another scenario, a patient who had a respiratory arrest after anesthesia and he had caudal and the CT was done showing that was, there was a big brainstem tumor. So again, this is rare occasions, but once in life is enough to tell you the lesson. Uh, cardiovascular system, look at the tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, hypotension could be either due to hypovolemia or heart failure. So fluids are not a treatment for hypotension for everybody. Sometimes it's worse in the scenario. So you should be vigilant enough and you can easily discriminate between both of them. Once you auscultate, again, listen and trust your auscultation. It's really important to start from the, the examination before anything. Once you are putting this patient in a track or another, you can use the ultrasound. Ultrasound could be your friend if you are trained enough, could be your fool and give you a misleading diagnosis if you are not trained enough. So before you judge, you can train yourself or seek training before. Uh, galloping rhythm, heart failure, how much pressure this patient on? Did he receive any inotropes uh, for the right heart like melrinone or the vitamin or the left heart like uh, adrenaline or vitamin? What is better than the other? You need to get a lot. And we'll go all, through all these ones uh, in our lectures in this course. Assist device, does, does this patient have any pacers, any uh, balloon or uh, uh, VADs, uh, RVAD or LVAD. Uh, so uh, you need to discover that as well. Assess the perfusion parameters. Always go clinical. Capillary refill time, the warm periphery, his lactate, uh, assess responsiveness. Uh, so there is a lot of lectures talking now about fluid responsiveness. Uh, be brave not to give fluids if your patient is not a fluid responder because the fluids are costly if it is used in uh, the wrong place. And there's a lot of cases I discussed before in ECHO and ultrasound. So Ashraf Tayyar has a lot of lectures about that one. So don't jump to the fluids all the time for every patient. No plan fits all. Shock assessment, and it, it's a full lecture, so tank, pump, and pipes. Uh, if there is a new drop in the blood pressure, make it as routine to do a new 12 lead ECG, Send for a troponin, uh, brain natriuretic peptide, plus minus bedside echo if you are trained enough to do so. Uh, again, respiratory need to talk to the patient, examine him well. Back is more important. Asthma and COPD, serial gases are important, but examination is more important. Sometimes the blood gases, the same blood gas, reflect more than scenario, and we'll discuss that in the asthma case. Chest x ray, compare always with the baseline and look in the system if you find high resolution CT of this patient, it may show that there is COPD or uh, old lung fibrosis. It may give you a good guide. And this is the beauty of the system in the Western countries. You can always find everything stacked in the system, joining all the hospitals. So you can find if the patient is presenting to a different hospital, you can find these old investigation and CTs. Be careful with your ultrasound. 
the barcode sign is not a sign of pneumothorax. Barcode sign just means there's no lung sliding. So there's a lot of reasons for no lung sliding. It could be a mucus plug obstructing his uh, lung uh, or this area of uh, uh, this lobe or uh, part of his lung. Uh, it could be a bronchial blocker. It could be a, a blood clot in his lung. So it just means there is no pleural movement in this point. Uh, and again, don't jump to the diagnosis before you are trained enough. Uh, study mechanical ventilation basis, basics. Uh, saving lives start really from here. If you wanna really save lives, you need to take the basic courses, basic life support, advanced life support, uh, fundamentals of critical care support, uh, CRRT or CVH courses, mechanical ventilation, basic and advanced courses. There's a lot of courses and we'll touch uh, on these courses in uh, different uh, occasions. Uh, prone positioning is not impossible in the area and, sorry, in the era in the interim of COVID-19, but it needs planning and you need to plan that in advance. Uh, hypoxemia, you need to listen to the chest, disconnect your patient from the ventilator and check if the, the problem is in the ventilator or from the patient, do a chest X-ray plus minus ultrasound. I would say ultrasound if you are trained is more important than the x-ray, but we need to do both in many occasions. If there is no obvious reason you can do a bronchoscopy, uh, unless your patient had just gone lung transplant, so you need to include the transplant surgeon uh, with you with an x-ray pre and post. Uh, echocardiography is a case series coming soon, says hemodynamically stable patient presented with respiratory manifestation. Uh, when they got the echo, the, the plan completely changed. I'm writing this case series nowadays. So weaning, and this is a lecture of Dr. Ashraf Tayyar, how to go with weaning from respiratory aspect, airway, B for B lines, AB profile, effusions, so examine his ultrasound, look at the spine sign, cardiac, look at the diastology and valvular heart disease, look at your diaphragm for thickness and weaknesses, and then E for electrolytes, there's a weaning, uh, protocol that will be one of our lectures in this course. Renal, the baseline, look at his history, ask him again, talk to the patient, how much you pee or you give urine per day, uh, then look at the numbers, look at his baseline creatinine, potassium, estimated GFR, a med calc application helps you with that. If your patient is anuric in ICU setting, in a presence of tachycardia, don't jump to the diagnosis of this hypovolemic, Sometimes the, the police catheter is blocked and you just need to palpate the bladder. Sometimes I made that like a few times in my life. If you are in doubt, put the ultrasound on the bladder and see if it's full of urine. So it is a blood clot or, 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 uh, or any plug in the, in the catheter and then you need just to flush it. Even if the nurse tells you you flushed it before, you need to palpate. It's your responsibility as a bedside clinician to rule that out. Put all the puzzle together, urea, urea, creatinine, sodium, urine color, chemistry. Don't rush with fluids, reassess with dynamic parameters or dynamic indices. Uh, so passive leg raise test with uh, pulse pressure variation is a good test with high predictability. Always calculate your output over the last 24 hours and this balance. Look at urea creatinine and get the whole image. If you want to add something more, B lines is a uh, good sensitivity and specificity for heart failure. You need to know how to prescribe the CVDH. That's your rule as an intensivist. Types of different and different modalities of CVDH. Take the course, it is your job. So CVDH is one of your tasks. GIT, three elements or three items of the fast hub is feeding and ulcer prophylaxis and glucose control. Early feeding is one of the good intensive care unit signs. And we have five lectures about nutrition in ICU with uh, Prof. Suhair Suleiman. Uh, if no bowel motion, always accuse your narcotics and then add bukinetics. Follow your hospital protocol, but don't forget to examine the patient and look at the lactate. And you need sometimes to discuss with the surgeon if the, the patient had no bowel motion for a good few days and you need to do, if there's a rise in lactate, is it systemic bowel, you need to do a CT abdomen with an IV contrast. TPN needs a nutritionist in your team. So again, it's part of that multidisciplinary team approach in the ICU. Hematology, we need a full blood count daily, uh, urea and electrolytes daily, and correct the uh, electrolyte disturbances. Coagulation is not routine unless the patient is on regular anticoagulation with heparin infusion. 
so hyperinfusion, sometimes when we start it, we stop uh, the fast hug, the thromboprophylaxis, but once we stop the hyperinfusion, like remember to put the thromboembolic prophylaxis of 40 dB or 40 OD, depending on what's your hospital protocol in prophylaxis. Uh, if this patient was an, on anticoagulation at home and then you resume that in a term of heparin infusion, don't again forget to put uh, his heparin uh, therapeutic dose once this heparin infusion starts. Part of our clinical assessment of the patient is lined. Crepsy or catheter-related bloodstream infection is a part of uh, your uh, key performance indicators and there's a lot of quality improvement projects and ICUs depending on that. There is no current evidence of routine exchange of your lines. There's no routine tip for cultures. So uh, if you take your central line out, don't send the tip for culture. I don't see any evidence behind this practice. Don't rewire, don't rewire your central line. Take the line out, try to seek a different site for your central line. There's no, it's like this is recommended against this practice unless you don't have any other way around. Uh, the micro or the item before last, sepsis. Look at patient temperature. Don't be deceived when you find your patient is apyrexic or on the system you find his temperature 36.8. He could be genuinely apyrexic or this could be something done artificially via the paracetamol regularly or the cooling blanket or he's on CRRT or he's on ECMO. So maybe he's septic and pyrexic but because of artificial maneuvers, he behaves like a normal thermic patient. Always look at the C-reactive protein and white cell count. If you have a procalcitonin in your unit, look at what is the antimicrobial he was on, what was the course, if you have an antibiogram in your hospital, and what are the recent culture sensitivity results, where is the bugs coming from, and then medications review. Pharmacist or clinical pharmacist should be definitely part of your team. Uh, it's an essential and it can, go, uh, can never go without uh, them. So there's a lot like if uh, a patient has fever, it could be uh, pyrexia uh, of known origin, which is a drug induced fever and pharmacist may help you with that. The drug drug interactions, if you're giving two drugs, uh, they may be contraindicated to be given together. So you have to replace one by another. Some drugs can be, cannot be used in the same line. And this table shows like if you are uh, giving uh, uh, cyclovir, for example, you cannot mix it with any line contain fixed rows or mix it with fixed rows. There's a lot of examples for that. Uh, so always remember if your medication, during your medication, if your most of medications uh, are given as nasogastric and your patient may be in need for single IV cannula, take out the central line as early as you can. This is one of the good practices. Always seek uh, the antimicrobial ST or CHEB uh, and seek the medications to be stopped. Does this patient need these drugs or not? So that's again in uh, affiliation or in liaison with his, uh, um, uh, the pharmacist, the clinical pharmacist. So the conclusion and recommendation plan, major history, cause of hospital admission, current active problems, systematic review, plan of previous teams are essential before you start to plan your new plan to treat these patients. Put all the buzzers together. It is definitely a teamwork, not one man show and never one man show. Follow up your patients daily even if you are not in the ICU, seek how he is doing. Is he progressing or regressing? Is he in remission or lapse? Discuss families and please be sympathetic with families. Our patients give us a lot, give us the skills, give us uh, the practice, give us the money. So they really deserve what we're doing for them. Uh, always ask for your seniors feedback as this is how you can improve continuously. Okay, there's no other way around. So the first example here of case scenarios, I had an asthma lady, 40 year old lady, and she came to ED and she is normalizing her pH and CO2. And that was the cause of ICU referral. It, as you know, asthma lady, when she started, or asthma patient, when starts to normalize the CO2 and pH, this means you are going to fail. Now, if you examine the patient, you will find the clue. If it's a tight chest, really tight chest and CO2 is normalizing, that means your patient is failing, you need to intubate as quick as you can. But if you have mild or very mild asthma, that means your patient is normalizing because he is improving, okay? So ask more questions, chat with the patient. If he's talking full sentences, if the, the auscultation is 
saying that the wheeze is really minimal wheeze. Again, trust your auscultation. Review the previous notes to compare the current condition ways. Don't intubate every patient normalizing his, ABG, his ABGs. That's a frequent scenario. Again, uh, so once uh, you start back-to-back -back nebulization, you may cause the beta-2 effect and hyperlactatemia with acidosis. So it could be respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis or mix of both. Anything can happen in the asthma. Be vigilant enough to examine, talk to the patient, sculpt the chest first. Case scenario number two, traumatic brain injury, time is brain. So quickly go through A, B, C, D, E survey, hand in hand with your active resuscitation. Look at the pupils and localizing manifestation, CT brain urgently, neurosurgery on board. Second, secondary brain insult is the one preventable. So you have to avoid hypoxia, hypercapnia, uh, seizures, uh, hypohyperglycemia, all this. Manitoulin Lasix, uh, no starch, please. All the starch are contraindicated in traumatic brain injury, particularly with ICP. So if you need to give fluids, give saline or uh, compound sodium lactate, there's no place for starch in this occasion. It's contraindicated by uh, the FDA. A case scenario number three, if you are dealing with a patient with cardiogenic shock on an ECMO, uh, so what was the cause of this cardiogenic, cardiogenic shock? Is it an MOI? So I need to give him uh, the anti ischemic measures. Is the valvular heart disease? Is the heart failure? Is it myopathy? Uh, what is the cause? ECMO is a bridge to what? You need to ask yourself this question. Is this patient planned for a left ventricular assist device, right ventricular assist device, by ventricular assist device, or he is forbidding to a transplant? So is he anticoagulated? If he has a head, the anticoagulation is an Argatroban. Are you familiar with Argatroban uh, infusion regimens? So again, look at what I mean, regulation. What are the ECMO settings? If this patient is an ECMO, is it a VV or VA ECMO? What's the oxygen flow? What's the blood flow? The pressure gradient? There's a lot of requirements on that as well. So every one of these cases will go uh, with multiple uh, lectures uh, down the line in our course. Case scenario, COPD with a pulmonary hypertension. What is the cause of exacerbation of the COPD? Is it infection? And if it is infection, what is the source? What's the organism? cultures and sensitivity, antimicrobials, uh, the hospital and ICU course, current management is in nitric oxide or milrinone, what is the ventilation settings, how is the ABGs improving or uh, deteriorating, the right ventricular response uh, to the current therapy, what is his RVSP or pulmonary arc pressure, uh, are we monitoring him non-invasively or with the swine GANs? So this is how we look on different scenarios with different patients. I think we keep the questions, I'm sorry if I got some more time more than my time and uh, thanks for your attention I'm stopping here